Heisenberg's uncertainty equation is one of my favorite equations. If you can have a favorite, it's mine. Um, it's, it's really deep, actually, what it ends up meaning. Even though the equation itself looks really, really simple, um, I'm going to just show you. Here's the equation, just delta x delta p greater than h over 4 pi. Who cares, right? Um, it's what it means that just blows my mind. So I have this whole actually presentation. I do a whole TOK presentation actually about um, this. I actually call it um, quantum mechanics and the equation for free will. And this Heisenberg is uncertainty principle ends up being the equation for free will. I want to explain just very, very briefly the idea behind all this. Um, and it stems from this idea, at least the result, that the act of observing or making a measurement actually alters the system, at least on a very, if you're doing it on a very small scale, it can. So this is the idea. Um, it came from a very, very simple concept. The idea that what is light? Is light a particle? Is it a wave? And there existed some experiments you can do like, um, I mean, at first people thought it was a particle because, you know, light can bounce off things. So reflection works. Um, it can refract and slow down. So that worked. But then you do diffraction, something like this right here, where, you know, you'd expect if light was a particle, wouldn't you expect that, you know, if light was shining through these two openings here you know and projected on the screen wouldn't you expect that light should do something like this you know these two sort of big dots if light was a particle it should do that but it turns out if you have the right sort of uh, conditions here with the right sizes of these openings compared to the wavelength uh, of a light you can end up with something like this you end up with everything this sort of diffraction pattern here this sort of thing right here where you see these different dots here like this it's the spreading of light and it turns out a particle can't do this only a wave can do this so then everyone was happy, like, okay, got it. Light's a wave. We got it. We figured it out. You can go back and do the math. Uh, there's a Dutch guy named, well, we call him Huygens, but I think um, Dutch call him like Huygens. Or I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. If you're Dutch, I'm sure you'll correct me. Um, but anyway, he had figured out the math back uh, on the, all this stuff to figure out, okay, well, if light is a wave, then you can do the wave equations for reflection, refraction. Everything works out. Great. Light's a wave. But then along comes another experiment, this photoelectric effect, it turns out. If you do photoelectric effect, only light as a particle can do that. And then it becomes really confusing, like, uh, what? You're telling me that this diffraction thing that I just showed you right here, like, that means light has to be a wave, not a particle. Yes. Then you do this other experiment, uh, this uh, photoelectric effect, say, light as a wave can't do this, only a particle could do this. Yes. So which is it? Is it a particle or is it a wave? That's why I love this thing right here. Light is a, if you read it carefully, it looks like, it looks like a wave. And if you look at it really carefully, it looks like particle. Clever. I love this. So that's why it could be a wave or it could be a, you know, obviously like P, A, you know, R, T. You get the idea. I, C, L, E. A particle. That's the idea behind it, right? Part. Yeah, it's supposed to be an R here. So particle. Uh, so which is it? What I love is that, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of these quantum mechanics, uh, big wigs, uh, they're basically saying, don't worry too much about what it is. Does it have to be a wave or a particle? Like, ah, just let it be what it needs to be. Let it be whatever it wants to be. So you don't have to worry too much. Now, the interesting thing is this. They did this experiment, and it turns out um, something really interesting was happening. You could send not just light, you can send solid matter through this. So let's say we do the same experiment with you know, two slits, for example. You can send, oh, I don't know, electrons, which we for sure knew weren't waves. Those are particles. We would shoot particle, uh, electrons through this, and it turns out electrons, under certain conditions, they can do this. So solid matter can do this. Like, uh, what? You're telling me solid matter can act like a wave? Yep. It's this idea actually called the de Broglie uh, hypothesis. They have this idea that light can actually, uh, it has a wavelength, it can also um, have a momentum. And it turns out then it means that anything else with momentum can also have a wavelength. So they call this a wave particle duality. So you can see like, where am I? What's my momentum? Where am I? Uh, you know, what are you worrying about? Am I a wave or a particle? Basically it's this idea that Waves can act like particles, particles can act like waves, so really strange stuff. And trust me, this is very weird. So then scientists at the time, this is early 1900s, they're trying to figure out, okay, what in the world is going on here? All our particles are waves, everything's a big mess. Uh, of course, I'm paraphrasing uh, immensely, but this is the basic idea. Uh, so what I think is so fascinating about this is this. They decided, all right, let's figure out 
you know, if these solid particles like electrons are acting like waves, that means they must be somehow like interfering with themselves. So they thought maybe, I don't know, maybe this electron is like, maybe there's two electrons and some of those two electrons are interfering with themselves to make this wave sort of behavior. So they did something really clever. They thought, let's just fire one electron at a time. Just one electron, then another electron, and you wait. There's no way those electrons could then interfere with each other. And you still end up with this diffraction pattern. You're like, oh God, what? So then they thought, this is really clever. And they said, okay, let's try to find out which hole did the electron go through? Because if it's gonna interfere with itself, I mean, which, which opening is it going through? So this is the amazing part. They do this experiment where they can detect which hole it went through. So I don't know, you have some sort of detector, maybe like a photomultiplier, you know, something that anytime a photon or electron or something passes through here, it basically says a blip and says, I got it, it went through this hole. Turns out when you turn on that experiment and you do this sort of thing right here where you actually detect which hole it went through, then the electrons behave like this, like particles. When you don't care where they went through, in other words, when you're not looking at, uh, it basically, you're basically not caring where they went through. You just let them do their thing. They do this. So it's like they're being watched. Let's say they know they're being watched. Now I saw this, uh, oh, what's it called? What the bleep do we know? I think from YouTube. Uh, that is totally not what's going on. They add a lot more mystery to things. I mean, no, these electrons are not sentient. They don't know they're being watched, but isn't this strange? I think is the important thing. So they figured out this, the, Mac, the act of observing, and I really do mean this observing, like making a measurement. If you're gonna detect which hole it went through, it alters the situation completely. So people thought, oh God, maybe there's like sentient, atoms and things no 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 no. it's actually not nearly that complicated it's really simple turns out schrodinger helped us to figure it out it's all about probabilities the idea was this um any probability is possible uh, or sorry any possibility is possible when you haven't made an observation you just let it be right you let them pass through whatever they want to anything is possible they can pass through one hole the other hole or both the dodgy part comes when when you actually do make the measurement when you actually measure and say, it for sure went here. Do you see that? That means there's no way it could have gone through the other one. So it's like all the, you, you observe the system means you collapsed all the other possibilities. That's why then it will act like this. It's still really strange. I will absolutely give you that. Uh, famously, someone said, uh, was it Richard Feynman? I don't know if he had said this, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but he basically said, you know, no one really knows about quantum mechanics, exactly how it works. Now, it doesn't mean it's not an important endeavor. It just means that there is a lot to figure out and the universe is way weirder than we could have ever imagined. Turns out everything's about probabilities. Turns out anything is possible. This is really mental, but watch this. If I take my hand right here and I just keep like tapping my finger at my hand, there is a probability, not zero, that my atoms will decide to go just through my hand. It won't make a hole. They'll just like end up at the other end. It's called quantum tunneling. You're like, uh, what? Good news, the probabilities are very, very small. That's why good news, solids are still solids. But on a very, very small scale, we say quantum mechanical scale, which means extremely small things. Let's say you fire electrons at a thin thing, and those electrons, there's a probability that one of those electrons might pass through that object, this quantum tunneling. And you can actually do the math and figure out the probabilities through this wave equation of um, Schrodinger's, and you can actually calculate then what's the probability of this happening? And you can say, huh, looks like I should have, I don't know, this many per hour happening. And then you actually do the experiment and it happens. This really is possible. So weird stuff happens, stuff that we really have trouble wrapping our brains around. But the universe is really weird. But the one thing that seems to be is it's all about probabilities and about measuring. Measuring, it turns out, seems to alter it. So now comes this. Uh, I mean, Planck figured out the smallest interaction you can have. And you might say, well, I'm going to make the tiniest measure. I'm just going to look at it and just going to Well, he figured out the smallest little eh you could have. He said it's 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34. And I think it's joule seconds, if I remember correctly. So this tells you this is the smallest interaction you can have, which is really small, but you can't have smaller than that. So Heisenberg, the clever guy that he was, he figured out, oh, let's use this idea and let's work out how it works. And he figured out this, that delta x delta p is greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. This is the uncertainty equation. This is actually, uh, I would call it the equation for free will even, you could say. Um, 
Now, what this means is this. You've got the uncertainty on position, which means when you actually make a measurement of position, you have an uncertainty on it. You have some sort of fuzziness in your measurement. That's delta x. Then you have delta p, which is the uncertainty on momentum. Remember, momentum contains a velocity term, so it's like saying speed. So you have you know, your uncertainty on position, you have your uncertainty on the speed. And it have to be greater than some value. And what this means is really fundamental. It's, it's powerful. What it means is that if you know something's position really, really well and accurately, that means that your delta x gets really, really small. In order for this uh, inequality to hold, delta p has to go bigger. Which means the better you know, that's why I write it down here, the better you know an electron's position, right? So if you know an electron's position, so delta x is really, really small, the worse you know the speed, because delta p is really large, and vice versa. The problem is there's a fundamental limit to the universe in what you can measure. You can't know both. Which is why I would say it's the equation for free will, because it um, shows that you can't live in a deterministic universe where you can calculate everything. Because now it becomes very fuzzy. It's all about probabilities. You can't know anything for sure, for sure. By the way, there's also a version with energies and times. Um, now comes, uh, and I like this t-shirt then, right? This I'm uncertain about quantum mechanics. See, it's about uncertainty. Uh, and I think now we can actually explain one of my favorite jokes. Are you ready? Now that you know about uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. It's really, really short. It's really, really simple. You might have heard it before, but if not, I think you're going to like it. Heisenberg's driving in his car. He gets pulled over for speeding. The officer says, any idea how fast you were going? He says, no, but I know exactly where I am. <laughs> yes, because of Delta P and Delta okay. Anyway, um, one way I would like to uh, explain it to you maybe with this idea of uncertainty is uh, just like with, I'm just looking at pictures of motorcycles at some point. And I remember thinking, I, I don't know why, because I don't really, I don't ride a motorcycle, I'm too scared. Uh, but if you look at this, this reminds me a little bit about uncertainty. So watch this. If you see a picture like this of a motorcycle, you know, someone's, someone's actually sort of, uh, you know, um, taking a, a, a picture, a snapshot as they're sort of panning, as they're sort of moving the camera along. What this ends up doing is this. It tells you this per you can have an idea about the person's speed here. Does that make sense? Because the blurriness of the background tells you something about the velocity. But do you notice, though, if that's the case, you have no idea about this guy's posi position. I'm assuming it's a guy. I don't see hair and limbs sticking out. Of course, girls can have short hair. I don't know. Assuming this person's uh, speed, you can tell the speed somewhat from the blurriness of the picture. But by that, the more blurry the picture gets the background, you don't really know this person's position. So it's kind of like this analogy here. Whereas, uh, by contrast, this kind of picture here, you, you've taken a very short exposure time picture where you can really see the background. Can you see here you can tell this person's position? They're right in front of this red thingy here where this grass is right there on this corner. You can know this person's position pretty accurately. Do you see though here, you have no real way of telling, just from this picture, this person's velocity. It's like, you know, now that you know the position really, really well, you don't really know this person's speed. You're assuming they're going fast enough to stay upright. I mean, maybe this person's just taking a nap and just sort of leaning like this, you know? So I'm just trying to say this is a way to try to help you to understand this idea here that um, we can know something's position really well or we can know its momentum really well. In other words, delta x can get really, really small if we know it well. But we can't know both. The better you know one, the worse the other one gets. There's a fundamental limit to measurement in the universe. Awesome!